brought to you by Form Systems, the leader in API and cloud gateway technology. So my name is Misha Belenka. I work for Azure Machine Learning, and I'll be happy to tell you all about it uh, and more. I'll give you a bit of a sky, sky view and uh, a bit of a backend view as well. Uh, after all the tutorials yesterday, it's very encouraging to hear that we're working on something that a lot of other people are interested in. Uh, and hopefully you'll find this useful, especially the backend part, for those of you who are working on those similar tools. So the way I'll structure this is that it'll be a bit of a skydive by, followed by a deep dive. Um, I'll share a pretty broad vision uh, of a data science economy, uh, which is related to predictive APIs, because in that vision, predictive APIs are both the good services being traded as well as the mechanism uh, for the actual uh, circulation. Um, and then I'll uh, go down to introducing the actual product uh, that we released in the summer uh, into preview. And after that, I'll give you a bit of an open kitchen view uh, from the standpoint of the algorithms backend team uh, that I lead. And I'll finally, for the hardcore learning folks among you, uh, I'll give you for dessert uh, something interesting uh, about deep nets. Uh, that we hope will be useful and hopefully more popular. So with that, let's begin. Um, so one thing we saw in the last decade or so is that the cloud and software have created entire new economies. Uh, there are new markets for different types of content, for software, for media, for uh, movies, books, and so on. Uh, and this has really exploded to where the total value in these economies is now over 100 billion. And the key unifying theme for all of them is that they enable creative people to reach consumers much more directly than they used to be able to in the past. So there's really this elimination of the, of the publisher layer uh, that has allowed these economies to flourish. And so what has happened is that when anyone can become a publisher in this self-service type mode, uh, a lot of creativity is unleashed, uh, both in software, in media, and so on. So what do we mean specifically by that? I'll just give you a couple examples. So a lot of the common things that emerged in the past few years is kind of the household names, uh, Justin Bieber, Fifty Shades of Grey, and so on. Uh, they really came from this uh, new world where you know, Bieber first put out a YouTube video, Fifty Shades of Grey was originally self-published. Uh, and then it's the initial push that has taken them out. Um, and this has been a really huge game changer, of course, in software as well, where the app stores have truly taken over as one of the dominant modes of software distribution. So one question out there is, what about data scientists? Right? So on one hand, we have this uh, huge explosion in demand for data scientists, and uh, again, that all of us here are to serve in one way or the other. But at the same time, uh, for if you are a data scientist, there's not really an obvious outlet for your creativity. There's not really an app store. And so that's one thing we haven't figured out and that still stands to be done. So to make it more clear, uh, let's just look at the old world of software distribution. And in that world, uh, basically software firms had developers which created software, which then were sold uh, by stores or by distributors. And then consumers uh, bought floppy disks or later CDs and then installed or downloaded software and then installed on their devices. And that's kind of a closed system because everything flows through that publishing layer. So one example we can look to is the app stores, which have really inserted themselves into that loop. And they have been pretty critical uh, in providing developers with a direct line to consumers. So now anybody can write an app for any popular platform and publish it on an app store, and then consumers can like it or not, and if enough of them like it, uh, it takes off. So in the end, this has really allowed uh, lots of new creative things to come out. And so that's the question for data science now, is that is there, what is the analogy for data scientists to where they could now push what they produce uh, which is solutions, uh, predictive models, and so on, much more broadly into a marketplace, which would then be distributed to consumers, and the consumers would do the voting with their downloads, effectively. 
And so that's really the question for us to figure out is in that circle for, for data science, uh, what would be the components? And so the obvious piece, uh, first of all, is that you have data scientists who are producing analytical models. Um, of course, they can do that using various tools uh, today and a lot of the new tools that have been introduced here. Uh, but then the key new piece that's not quite there uh, yet that, it will, that we, hope, we hope is coming in is that the marketplaces for these solutions which will enable distributing them to a lot more users in the end. Uh, so let me just guide you through a very simple example. Um, so Joseph Sirosh, uh, Azure ML, who leads the Azure ML effort, uh, he had a long successful career at Amazon. Um, been supposed that on the weekends he still misses the retail world and he wants to open a little store called Joseph Mart and then take on Amazon on his weekends and evenings. Uh, but as we all know, one of the things that really is important for any online store is a feature uh, that provides recommendations. So customers who bought this also bought. So if you are a little online store owner, uh, of course, you can either hire somebody specifically for you to code you up the recommender feature. Uh, but that's not really right, because every, if every store ends up doing it on their own, uh, that's not so great. Uh, but at the same time, it's not just about the actual app. It's also about deploying it. So for example, if your store uh, goes big, uh, the load on that custom solution that someone has done for you will suddenly increase proportionately. So the scaling aspect of it is actually pretty non-trivial. Uh, so how would you then deploy those services in a way that is elastic and that scales? So going back to the virtual cycle and software, uh, what we want to build is we want the ability to build a, a solution that decouples the need for worrying about scaling out. Uh, and so a data scientist who are starting uh, by building analytical models uh, can then publish them and then have them distributed. And so this is how this can be done uh, with Azure ML that I'll go into in more detail. So a data scientist would first author the model. Uh, they would experiment with some data. Uh, for the, in the case of the recommendations, uh, they would presumably have data about uh, shopping habits and, and uh, market baskets and so on. And so once they create such a model, what the, great, they would, test it, they would test it and they would try it. Uh, but the key question then is like, how do they then get it out uh, to the actual customers? And so this is one thing that's uh, really distinct and we want to really enable uh, to go much smoother is it being able to just publish the services uh, and have them be accessible and have them be elastic. Um, so in that little graph, those boxes that showed up at the bottom where your model does a scoring, uh, that's literally just a couple of clicks. Uh, that's all it takes you to stand up a service based on your experiment. Uh, at that point, the service runs in Azure. Uh, it's obviously scalable. Uh, and the data scientists don't need to worry about actual representation anymore. So, Besides experimentation, it's really the deployment, the operationalization uh, that we think is a key component of successful uh, movement towards a data science marketplace. So going back to the virtuous cycle, so great, so now you have created your service. Uh, you can publish it as an API. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, just a rest point uh, that anybody can point to. Uh, but then there is the next piece, which is now that you've done that once, you want to actually uh, be able to take it out to a lot more people and make it, make it not just an individual service, but also just an, something that other people could buy, subscribe, that will be metered, build, and so on. And so this is, again, going back to the actual tool. This is made pretty easy, because now that once you've run the experiment and once you've published the service, so here you select the input-output, uh, you say publish, uh, and that just stands up your service and tells you what the endpoint is. But the key thing is that now you want to actually take it to the marketplace uh, and have everyone be able to use it. So in, at that point, uh, the Azure data marketplace comes in because that's where having published a service, you're able to now have it on the marketplace and have anyone subscribe to you and have all the billing go through a platform. So that's what Azure ML is providing. Uh, all three stages of this process. Uh, both experimentation, the traditional data science work uh, that here is now able to be done in the cloud uh, collaboratively uh, on data that lives in the cloud. Uh, then it also provides the ability to publish the service. And finally, and what we think 
no less importantly, it gives you the ability to then put it out there for anyone else to take it, um, as opposed to having to hire a sales force and so on. And it's not, and the point is that it has to be third party. It doesn't, so we've obviously seeded this with a number of services uh, and uh, on the marketplace to illustrate what this is. Uh, but the real value comes from the fact that we already have third party consultants who are starting to publish valuable services, for example, in finance, uh, recommending and so on. And that's what we hope a lot of other people will do uh, by making the rest of the system easy to use and easy to onboard to. So this is uh, what the marketplace looks like. So in the end, after you've created your service, uh, here you just have it um, available effectively as an app. Uh, and your, uh, it's your choice of how do you want to bill for it, um, how do you want it uh, to be, well, if you want multiple tiers, and so on. And the really important thing is you want it to be very easy for the final consumers to take it uh, with just a few lines of code. Uh, they would then add the service that then ties to their data sources, uh, and then provides the features that are powered by the predictive analytics. So the key thing is that the data science economy in that vision uh, is really primed for this cycle where more demand for these services is what would power more data scientists to come out with more of these apps. Um, and that's the part that is crucial is that it's really the cycle of both the supply and the demand from the marketplace that lets this flourish as we have seen it happen with app stores uh, and with the other online marketplaces that have really taken off in the last few years. So that said, uh, let me now go and tell you more about the actual product, about Azure ML, uh, much in the spirit of the tutorials for all the other fun things we've seen here. Uh, and since it's available, uh, I'll give you a short tour, but I certainly encourage you to try it out yourself. So. The key motivation for this uh, product was the fact that there's major friction points in the data science predictive APIs in the cloud. And the two friction points we saw, uh, one of them was ease of collaboration. So historically, folks who worked in SaaS, R, or, or anything else, you're sort of tied to your desktop or your server. Um, you have to exchange files. You have to, I mean, so other people have referred to this fact that sharing is not really there. And so the ease of collaboration is really the key piece that makes the process much smoother, especially with teams, especially when people come and go. Uh, and that was one of the key things we wanted to enable. And the other side is the ease of deployment. Uh, so others have referred to this uh, divide between the data scientists who work in their world of R, scikit-learn, et cetera, um, and then the systems folks who are deal with Ruby, Java, and the actual part, the systems part of it that stands it up. Um, so that's really the motivation for really removing the boundary here, and we want to make the ability to publish something in the actual live service as easy as a few clicks, as opposed to many emails, calls, and uh, much coding. So it's kind of a quick overview of what the features are. Uh, so Azure ML has uh, lots of uh, actual analytic models in it, uh, both uh, from Microsoft in-house, um, as well as uh, from uh, R, and I'll show you in a second. And the key thing is that everything lives in the cloud. Uh, so both the authoring experience lives in the browser, uh, the execution lives in Azure, and then the services stand up on Azure as well. Uh, the authoring should be very easy. Uh, so as, again, with other systems, we found that this uh, drag, drop, connect uh, process um, makes things much easier uh, than having to debug. Because uh, basically then the canvas itself lets you connect things that should connect and uh, not connect things that shouldn't. Uh, at the same time, we want to offer more than just the wrapper around the existing uh, software out there. Uh, the upside of Microsoft uh, authoring this is that Microsoft has invested into machine learning for a couple of decades now. And a lot of products, existing products already have developed really state-of-the-art assets uh, in terms of classifiers, aggressors, and so on, uh, with products like Cortana, Bing, uh, Xbox, and so on, developing these solutions. And some of these solutions is what we're exposing here for everybody to use. At the same time, we realize that there is a huge amount of, of, of great algorithms out there that are, that are constantly uh, being improved, that are constantly replenishing. And that's why, at this stage, we wanted to go out with uh, R built in. So for folks who work in R, 
uh, we're providing a core foundation of 400 packages uh, built in that you can just reference directly. Uh, but at the same time, you can also bring your own R code and uh, additional packages if you wish, uh, the way we're packaging it. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, operationalizing with a click uh, is a very important property. Uh, it should be trivial to stand up a service because it really should be. Um, and finally, uh, we want to make this pretty easily available. So there's two tiers. Uh, if you go to Azure Com ML, uh, there's the free tier, uh, which requires nothing but your basic live ID, which is kind of just your standard Microsoft sign-on. Um, and then if you want to actually stand up services in production and so on, then you'll want to stand up for, sign up for the standard tier, uh, which then for, for which you will need the Azure account, of course. Um, so just a bit of an overview of what the canvas looks like. Uh, so this is sort of the main uh, interface, and I'll flip to the browser in a second. Uh, so the primary properties here are experiments, uh, because that's what you run. Uh, and then, of course, web services, because that's when you're, once you're done, that's what you put up. Uh, and collaboration, is, again, is key. So here you can easily add more people to view the same experiment, to modify it, to build upon it, and so on. And the core experiment canvas in the center is what lets you wire up the different pieces and have them run, uh, and let you do the experiments, cross-validation, et cetera. Try the different classifiers. So the two core parts of the process, as I alluded to earlier, one is just developing the model, where you put together the pieces, uh, you play with the different parameters, uh, you develop, you look at the results, you evaluate on holdout sets, and once you're happy with the evaluation results, you can then deploy the model by simply highlighting which parts of it you want to be the uh, import and the output for the published service. You click the published web service, and it's up. Uh, so the four core uh, model types uh, that are currently included are classification, regression, recommenders, and clustering. Uh, this is an ever-growing set uh, that we're expanding. Uh, so that's one thing we're very keen on hearing more from users of what, if there's other types of predictors that you're looking for, or if there's types of models that are not here that you would like added. Uh, we have a pretty big backlog of the uh, Microsoft internal stuff that we'll be happy to uh, put in here. So that's where please don't be shy about telling us what's missing. Uh, and just to give you a quick highlight of how R works, so R is just another box uh, in the system basically called execute R script, uh, into which you can pump in data with a standard data flow in the system. Uh, very often you find that you need more than one data set uh, that is going in, so just in case we provision two input ports for that. Uh, and you just refer to them as this MAML uh, map input port one and two. Uh, very often we see that people have either additional sort of more esoteric packages that they would like to reference, or they have their own custom packages. Uh, so those you can just zip up uh, and then have another input that accepts custom code. Uh, and then the output just becomes whatever your data frame uh, that the R script puts out. And so that pretty much sets you up to run R. So just quickly, let me flip to the view. So this is one of the sample experiments. Uh, if you open the, if you go to Azure ML and you go to sample experiments, so this one is, uh, I think, let's see, my screen is all messed up. So this one is uh, demand forecasting. Uh, I think this is the bicycles data set. Uh, it's very apropos. Everybody loves bicycles. And so this is what, in the execute R script, this is this module. So here you have a little editor for basically running R, which you put in, and then that's where uh, this becomes a part of the data flow. And so, for example, in this case, uh, we're actually doing pre-processing with R, while the actual prediction is done with a different model here. This is boosted trees. Uh, and so the same part, this kind of right part of the screen, is where you do all your standard hyperparameters, so number of trees, learning rates, and so on. Uh, there's a number of other, so data transformation you can do either with R, uh, or you, there's a lot of transformations that are put in, in terms of you can do the various projections, you can do feature hashing, and so on. Uh, and then training is sort of just a sort of universal train model uh, piece that whatever model you wanna do, uh, among the many that are in there, you will be able to train. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so for us, this was a really major uh, piece. Uh, it was much more non-trivial than one would think. Uh, those of you who also have worked on uh, deploying R know what I mean by that. Uh, but it is working. <laughs> so, 
after much work. So the key thing is that in the end, uh, what we end up with is we end up with this uh, entire data science workflow. Uh, and I guess this is pretty small font, so I guess I'll duck through it. Uh, where the key uh, pieces of the pro complete end-to-end -end data science project are all in the same tool. So first you get to provision a workspace, which basically means just uh, if you're working with a client, you would probably want to bill it to the client, or if you can bill it to yourself. But you basically get an Azure subscription, create, create a space. Uh, then you work on the normal loop of building a model where you would prepare your data. Uh, you would then featureize it, uh, play with different models, uh, evaluate it on holdout data, uh, and sort of iterate until you're happy with the accuracy metrics over the quality of the model. And then once you're done, you can just deploy as a web service. Uh, and then if you want to then make it a part of the data science economy, you would publish an actual app, uh, which is the final solution, uh, which takes it from sort of a private service that you've developed uh, for a specific uh, customer uh, to something that anybody can now take and utilize. So let me just give you a couple kind of quick overviews. And I apologize that the resolution here is not really conduced to 1024 by 768 is not what we counted on. Uh, but effectively, in here, experiments is sort of the major uh, part of it. And the samples has a pretty rich set of the various uh, standard uh, experiments that you would do. So for example, uh, let's take the most basic one. Here we have, uh, well, let's just take a downloading data set. So if there's a data set living on the UCI archive, such as adult income, uh, you can just read it in. Uh, and then you can run some statistics and then get some basic uh, information about what the properties of the data set are. So again, here, this is where you would get the, oops. For every feature, you're getting various uh, statistics for it. Let's see, and then I need to get out of this. <laughs> Let's see if escape works there. Um, so that's sort of your very naive thing. But then, okay, suppose you actually want to do uh, something like binary classification. So this is where things get interesting. So this is where all the various modules and data sets live. So there's a few saved data sets uh, that are coming in. A lot of them are UCI, uh, or basically public data sets. And then when you're creating your own data sets, they also uh, become a part of this workspace, again, living up in Azure. And then, of course, because of the data sets, there is a lot of these uh, different modules, which are now your pieces. And the machine, so there's the R language models, which is basically this execute R script as well as the, those in-house machine learning modules. So this initialized module has all the classification, clustering, and regression models. Uh, and this is where your boosted trees, uh, perceptrons, SVMs, et cetera, all live. Um, so with this, you can basically author an experiment like this. So let's see, this is a fun challenge. Uh, so, so basically here, we're reading in data set I guess you'll have to trust me or just do it on the laptop. Uh, we're taking data set. We're putting it through some pre-processing. We're, say, like, we're doing some missing value scrubbing. Again, there's custom modules for that. And so, like, if I'm looking for a missing value scrubber, I would just say, well, missing. And then this will find me both the data sets, uh, which have them are missing, as well as there's this missing value scrubber module, which I can just drag out, and that becomes a part of it. Um, for every module, this is where, like, this is the missing value scrubber, uh, so you can specify how you want to do the missing value scrubbing. Um, you can uh, sample data sets, free sample them, and so on. Uh, this is where the training happens. Um, so you're wiring, wiring all of this. Uh, you then hit run. It runs. Uh, one of the nice things is that it caches pretty much everything. So suppose I ran this. So I ran this before. You see, it's like it, it, it has completed. Uh, it finished running, uh, it says here. So suppose I want to swap out the model, and instead of uh, boosted trees, um, say I want to try, let's say, what do I want to try? I want to try, let's say, logistic regression. So I would say logistic, uh, and then I'll take the two class, and then I'll wire this in. Let's see. Oh, this is fun. I'll wire, oh, let me make this bigger. So this is my logistic regression that I'm going to put in over here as my to my trainer. Uh, and we have uh, L what's known as LBFJS LQN optimizers, for those of you who are into this thing. So you can play with the regularization parameters. You can play with memory size for LBFJS and so on. Uh, so suppose I'll 
take L2 off and just leave L1. Um, and so now I'm going to run this. Uh, and now this is running, basically it's going to run just the pieces, the training. So for example, the scrubbing and the sampling is going to just uh, pick it up from cache uh, since that part of the graph has not changed. Um, uh, so this is going to take probably a, not too long since I don't think it's a very, it's like a medium-sized data set. Uh, and then again, I've pre-marked here as my publish input and output uh, nodes over on this, on, 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 over on, on, this, on this module. So here you can see that it actually is already done training. It's now scoring. And once it's done scoring, as it has now, uh, I can now look at the results. So here I can look at visualize. And this will give me the PR curve, as well as if you go down, some of the standard metrics, uh, like AUC precision and so on. And it can play with threshold uh, to sort of see what effect this has on the different metrics. So this is your normal machine learning 101. And so for the true magic, so this is where the publish button comes in. So now I've supposed that's the model I want to actually stand up. Uh, so I just say publish service here at the bottom. Uh, and then I say, yeah, I'm pretty sure I want to publish it. So on it goes. Uh, and then here now in this uh, services, uh, it immediately gives me uh, both the API key for using this as well as it has stage two services. So one is this uh, basic RRS for a single point. Uh, so I, now I can, and I can test it by basically literally putting in the features. So this is the adult income data set. So the features are various demographics and so on. Uh, so if I was to put in the feature values, it would then test me and give me a score. Uh, but then if you click through here in the API help page, it actually tells you uh, what the full on uh, endpoint is for this. Uh, the request format, and then it'll give you the sample code uh, for uh, different, so this is the sample request, and then it'll actually give you the, uh, the sample code in C-sharp, Python, and R that will allow you to immediately consume the service from your uh, client-side code. So let's see. How do I go back? Uh, yeah. Okay, and then so at that point, this service is what's known as stage. It's not in production yet, so I'm ready to test it. Uh, but then you can just uh, move it to production, uh, and at that point, it becomes available to anybody. You just send them the URL. Uh, and the other, there's also, so besides the RRS, there's also the batch execution. So suppose you want to score large chunks of data. Uh, obviously, you don't want to send the individual requests one by one. Uh, so here, you can point the batch execution service uh, to a data set that's in Azure or in, uh, as, or in SQL, uh, Hive query, and so on. So that's how the uh, endpoint works. And then there's an entire separate workflow for actually standing up the market uh, in production. Okay. So with that, uh, let's move to the next part. Um, so this was sort of the above ground view of what the vision is and what the product is. Um, and since I lead the backend algo team, I want to give you a bit of a flavor for uh, what's actually behind it. So one of the things is that we've come into is that we, when we were designing what would be a good machine learning backend uh, powering a service like this, uh, this question of polymorphism with respect to lots of these different things came up. Um, so it, on the surface, you can immediately see that, okay, there's all these tasks that we want to do classification, regression, recommending, but actually the list goes much further out. There's always new tasks. Um, and traditionally, the way this has been done is that, well, we'll, like, we'll just create a new task type and then have sort of custom code for doing this. Uh, it's kind of a pain. Um, another type of polymorphism is that data comes in in all sorts of nasty forms. Uh, and if we want it to run through efficiently, uh, very efficiently. <laughs> it becomes a really hard thing of how to handle those data flows where uh, the data uh, changes types, the data gets transformed, um, and that's something I want to talk about. And then there is also the question of different front ends. Uh, so in the product right now, we're basically exposing everything through the browser front end. Uh, but again, Microsoft is a giant company, and internally, folks have uh, wanted to consume us in all sorts of ways. Uh, so we also had to write the backend in a way that would be consumable uh, in a variety of other ways, at least internally for now. So 
just to give you a kind of a flavor of the way we solve this, hopefully it will be useful to those of you who are also working on machine learning backends. Uh, so in terms of the task polymorphism, so where all these tasks, if you look at them carefully, there's really three different pieces that are distinct between them. Um, so one is, of course, the output variable. Uh, so in some cases, you're predicting your prediction is just a single float. Sometimes it, it's a probability in the 0-1 interval. Um, other times, it can be a tuple. Like, for example, you've, you're predicting both a raw margin and the calibrated probability for classification. In yet other cases, you're predicting uh, structures such as float arrays, say, for multi-class classification or for clustering, where you want to predict the different cluster probabilities. Input type can also vary. Uh, so for the simple tasks, uh, it's typically a single example. Uh, but as soon as you go into tests like ranking, uh, you no longer are dealing with a single example. You're now dealing with entire sets of examples. Um, and that's something you also want to be sort of friendly to if you're writing a single backend pipeline for this. And finally, of course, the metrics differ. Every task will have its own set, set of functions that evaluates the quality. Um, so just to give you a quick flavor of in the end, it was, of course, generics uh, that we ended up with, and we came up with this kind of uh, couple of interfaces from which everything else derives. Uh, so predictors are really central, uh, and then I just need to parameterize what are the types of features and what are the types of results uh, that it produces. And so this allows you to express lots of things, such as both the different output types, uh, whether you're doing you know, multi-class classification or, uh, classific or, or binary classification and so on, um, as well as whether you, some learners can be okay with mixtures of uh, categorical features and numerical features, while others only consume vectors and so on. Uh, more than that, also if you want to wrap lots of different learners that are developed by other folks, uh, again, some of them will just insist on using, say, a custom vector library. Uh, so in which case you'll be able to wrap them cleanly and passing them exactly the data types that you wish uh, by simply expressing them in the wrapper uh, using the types that they wish to have. And the trainer, uh, which is sort of the dual to the predictor, is something that uh, takes, again, a, a parameterized data set type and then outputs a predictor uh, in the end. So that was kind of the core abstraction uh, that is behind everything. Uh, and just to give you a fair warning, so this is not a public API yet. Uh, so this is, hopefully, it will be at some point. Uh, but that's sort of subject to change. <laughs> Okay, so another uh, aspect which is fairly polymorphic is the fact that uh, if you have multiple front ends that you want to serve, uh, you want to really decouple the presentation layer in the front end from the actual content, uh, from the actual algorithms that you are doing in the back. And so the standard things that you want to be very easy and really transparent and not have to do much work for is, uh, for example, adding a new algorithm. Uh, ideally, an algorithm author should just implement their trainer predictor pair um, and not then worry about, well, do I have to add some sort of something to a dialog boxes, drop downs, or the API calls? Um, same thing with uh, changing the hyperparameters. Suppose I want to extend my logistic regression and add a new regularizer to it or something. Um, again, it shouldn't be my job to do much in terms of the UI for it. I should just be able to say that, well, the algorithm has a new hyperparameter, and the UI would just pick it up. Um, and finally, kind of a layer above that, suppose we add a new task, say, ordinal regression, uh, which is going to be unlike everything else. Again, uh, this is something that ideally should be just coded up on the back end uh, with the UI picking it up uh, and exposing it automatically. Uh, so again, for those of you who worked on this stuff, the answer is not very surprising. It's a reflection. So what you want to do is then you want to have the platform uh, introspect uh, the actual code base that, that's loaded, and then pick up all these different pieces, the algorithms, the hyperparameters, the tasks, basically all the assets that you have. Um, and so that part is probably obvious. What's less obvious is that how do you do it in a way that is fairly on one hand, open, uh, because you can int always introduce new types of interfaces, new types of tasks, and so on. But at the same time, you want the, the front ends to be able to cleanly delineate what is it to show. So for example, if you say that my binary classifier has a calibrator, I want to be able to just specify that, OK, this new piece uh, only needs to pick up calibrators. Uh, and so this is where it's not just introspection and reflection. You actually need to have additional uh, uh, additional code that implements those type constraints, signature constraints, uh, that allows uh, then you to cleanly 
have these things compose. Uh, so for example, if you had an ensemble which has a base learner, uh, the ensemble should really not care about, other than saying that, okay, I want a base learner that is a binary classifier, uh, to really do more than that. So it should be sufficient to just specify some very simple constraint on the type of hyperparameter. Okay, so with that, we'll move to the final fun part, uh, which is NetSharp. So several folks have mentioned deep nets. Uh, and not surprisingly, deep nets are all the rage. Uh, so this is the Google Trans graph. Uh, you can see that they're talked all about. Uh, and I, I had this thing until I opened the news last night, and guess what? Uh, November 17th, 2014, New York Times technology section, research analysis, adv advanced image recognition software. I think this is about fourth or fifth article in the Times in the last like year that mentions deep nets. Uh, and this is something that has not yet been seen in the machine learning world. Um, so, okay, so some people are skeptical, some people are very enthusiastic, uh, hopefully more enthusiastic than skeptical, because we really are getting very powerful models with all the recent advances. Um, even though the key structures uh, for uh, the deep nets have been invented really in the 90s, and by the way, just to be clear, what is meant by deep nets typically is the fact that you just have a neural net, uh, that has multiple hidden layers, and typically you will have some sort of interesting structure uh, in the layers that corresponds to the structure in the input. So, for example, convolutions for vision, uh, where you basically want to have these feature vectors going through, uh, or occurrences for, say, text, uh, where you have the sequential structure that you want to capture. Uh, so both of these examples, for example, were really done in the 90s. So the reason why this is such a huge thing uh, is really because we're finally able to see production grade results uh, with these models uh, due to two factors uh, primarily. One is that the hardware uh, has evolved to a point where now they can, we can train really big models on large data sets. Uh, and here the GPUs were really a key driver of this trend. Uh, so, and the fact that historically GPUs were really a pain to program and with, now with OpenCL and CUDA, they've become much less of a pain to program. And now, like, NVIDIA is releasing actually deep net libraries that they are coding up. So UDN came out about a month ago. Uh, that really is lowering the bar of entry for folks to start experimenting with uh, neural nets while utilizing the hardware very efficiently. And at the same time, uh, the other factor that actually has driven this uh, huge surge in popularity of these models is the fact that there have been a number of very interesting tricks uh, for training them uh, and really scaling up the training that have been developed in the last few years, uh, both in terms of just simple algorithmic tricks uh, that speed up learning um, and give you much more robust, much better results. Uh, so like things like dropout, for example, have become uh, common names, as well as uh, new types of structures, like, for example, rectify linear units, uh, different pooling types, and so on, that have uh, again, kind of come with this new wave of focus on uh, neural networks in recent years. So one thing that's missing uh, a bit is that right now there's sort of a zoo of tools out there. Uh, so the three arguably most popular tools in the kind of open source world are Theano, uh, which is kind of really a wrapper around other things, and then Cafe and Covnet. Uh, and the way you express the structure that is typically non-trivial for deep nets is uh, really custom for each of the tools. So in Theano, you basically use the API uh, to add more layers and specify what they are. Uh, in Cafe and ConvNet, uh, each of them has their own config file format for specifying the layer structure. Uh, and it's not, it, I mean, it, it works. Again, if you're, once you commit to a tool, you certainly can work with it. Uh, but it, looking at it, it could definitely struck us as not being as general as it should be. Um, so just to give you an idea of what we're trying to achieve, so let's just look at a few simple nets. So this is your basic uh, single hidden layer neural net. Uh, I don't know, you can say back from the 80s. So in this view, we have the input. Let's say this is a 28 by 28 uh, image uh, that's going in to a fully connected layer of 50 nodes. And say if we're predicting digits, uh, there's 10 of them. So there's going to be 10 output nodes uh, for each digit. Uh, so taking this a step further, uh, instead of a single uh, hidden layer, we can have two, two hidden layers, uh, and now we can start having properties, well, even before we could have properties like what is the number of hidden units, uh, what is the activation function, and so on. Uh, but when things get really interesting is with convolutions. Uh, so this is a now classic uh, uh, topology. 
that includes a couple of convolutional layers and a couple of pooling layers. Uh, so for those of you who are not into deep nets, uh, the easy way to think about this is that what these things, so the sort of the full connected layers, they just sort of each hidden node uh, becomes a single feature which takes an entire image and then computes something and then sends it up. Uh, with the convolutions, what you're getting is you're basically creating little feature detectors, uh, kind of banks of feature detectors, which are trainable, uh, but each of them kind of slides over the entire image and then finds something. And then if you were to, like for uh, vision data, typically that ends up being some type of edge. Uh, so the higher up you go, the kind of more abstract these patterns become. So like in the, one of the earlier times articles, like they were really enamored with the fact that in the upper layers, they were sort of outlines of cats uh, based on a large uh, corpus of YouTube videos. Uh, but the true power of this comes from the fact that you're basically training these detectors of uh, patterns automatically without having to pre-specify them as historically has been done in vision uh, with all the various custom features such as Swift, uh, Swift Hog, and so on. Uh, and so this clearly becomes sort of not so trivial to express of how, it, like, well, I guess it's trivial to express if you just want to do it once, uh, but generalizing it becomes not so trivial. Uh, so we're lucky to have in our team some folks who have decades of uh, language design experience, uh, things like C-sharp and so on. So what we came up with, uh, Sean Katzenberger was the pr primary author on this, uh, is a language called NetSharp. Uh, and it's basically a DNN topology language. Uh, so for a simple, uh, and you can, I can, I'll walk you through the example again. So this is flipping the net upside down to sort of correspond to the way it goes. So the way you would express uh, the two hidden layer net, you would just say that my input image is a 28 by 28 uh, matrix. And then for uh, the subsequent layers, you specify what the dimensionality is uh, and what is the source layer for it. Um, and so the syntax here is kind of a mix of basically C sharp uh, with a, um, kind of a functional form. So this is a basic example. So for a less basic example with the convolutions, again, this is where I'm flipping the image upside down. Um, so just to give you a flavor, for the first layer, that is the convolutions uh, of these. So basically, we're training those little uh, five by five detectors, and we're going to train, let's say, five of them. Um, so here, we are able to say that now our inputs is still going to be a 20 by 28 image, uh, but our first hidden layer is going to be this of this type convolve, and it's going to have parameters like kernel shape, uh, map count, input shape, and so on. Uh, and there's a lot more there. And so basically, you can keep composing this uh, in various ways. So the pooling layer uh, becomes a different, another layer that then takes uh, from the layer above it. Uh, different layer types can have various parameters and so on. Uh, and this really works nicely uh, because in the end, you end up with this kind of single description uh, that is compilable uh, and that is actually a full language. So the difference, I think, we primarily with and the dissatisfaction of what's out there came from the fact that uh, the current protocols are just sort of custom configuration scripts, um, as opposed to what you often need is actually a full-on language. Uh, because you want to have constants, you want to have variables, you want to have expressions. Uh, so for example, it's not uncommon uh, that you will have multiple channels, say RGB depth and so on, and you will want to say that a certain layer uh, will only look at pixels with certain uh, from certain other layers, or basically have expressions which capture what the structure should be. Um, so what is really central here is this notion of a bundle type. Uh, so bundle type just simply means a set of edges, and then here we want to have the same types of bundles that are commonly out there. Uh, so convolutions, fully connected, pooling, response norm, and so on. Uh, so they just become uh, those types of layers, each with their own parameters. Um, and the true power comes from the fact that now, because it's a full-on language, we can have lambda expressions, uh, which allow us to specify uh, how each of the bundles should take its inputs, uh, and basically how it should filter the structure. Um, another type of interesting uh, property is that uh, something called shared weights. So the fact that you can lock certain sets of uh, bundles to be shared uh, effectively allows you to have recurrent nets with this. Uh, so this is actually up in the, if you just search for Azure ML NetSharp, uh, you'll see that in the documentation there is a full-on specification page for this. Uh, and this is something where we'll love to kind of work on more broadly and then kind of get adopted out there uh, just as an open standard. Okay, uh, so that wraps it up. I'll be very happy to take questions. And just to give you a recap, uh, 
there's multiple layers to this predictive API business, as we've seen from the variety of talks, right? So there's kind of the uh, broad desire to have uh, this uh, machine learning solutions be readily available, uh, become a commodity, uh, have data scientists become, uh, well, I don't know if data scientists want to become more of a commodity or not, but definitely become their solutions to become more easy to spread out. Um, Azure ML is something we just put up and uh, we're very proud of and we're working on actively uh, towards GA uh, sometime next year. Uh, and hopefully those uh, tidbits on the back end and on NetSharp were useful to some of you. And we're hiring, of course. Right. Awesome, Misha. Thanks. Yep. Brought to you by Form Systems, the leader in API and cloud gateway technology.